Can you guys all hear me? Good. Um, so yeah, so I've done uh, a fair number of different approach. I've used a fair number of different approaches. I'm really interested in top-down control in the brain. Today, because I, ha I know we're talking about networks a lot this week, and I will be the primary representation of resting state networks, I'm going to focus especially on those. But you know, feel free to interrupt me or ask questions about the others, and hopefully we'll have time to chat about that later as well. So I'm going to frame this sort of um, skills talk a little bit in the context of some of the work I've done um, and talk um, briefly and conceptually about the methods and then you know, interrupt if you want more details or we'll talk more about it during the lab this afternoon. So just to start off the talk, um, a long history in psychology and in neuroscience has approached the question of how the brain functions from two fairly different perspectives many of which I think you guys will be covering this week. You know, on the one hand, um, a lot of effort has gone into trying to understand the specialized processing that goes on in individual brain regions, how particular neurons might be tuned for different um, aspects of, for example, a visual stimulus and visual cortex or motor actions and motor cortex. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of work has also gone into trying to understand the interactions that occur between these different brain regions, for example, between visual and motor areas in order to carry out actions. So o overall, my uh, goal is to try to understand how these two different levels of processing might work together to carry out brain function, and in particular in the context of uh, complex tasks and top-down control. And so in the talk today, I'm really going to focus on the latter aspect and the ways that we can measure networks in the brain, functional networks in the brain. And in the first uh, part of the talk, I'm going to focus in particular on whether different um, models of brain function based on graph theory or network topology um, reflect meaningful aspects of brain function or can add to our understanding of brain function. And so here I'll tell you about a study we did using a lesion approach to get at this. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to look, um, kind of taking off of Chris's uh, presentation, at how networks might vary along different time scales. Here, looking at much longer time scales um, and using measures more similar to resting state fMRI. So we'll look at both individual differences as well as how t um, these networks might change between task and rest context. So um, for the talks today, I'm going to be using exclusively functional magnetic resonance imaging data, uh, or fMRI. I'm not going to sort of bore you with the details of the bold signal, but I wanted to put this up just to emphasize that fMRI is really uh, uniquely well suited to measuring large scale networks in the brain because it allows you to measure signals from the entire brain at once, which allows you to then measure, construct these uh, brain networks. at a fairly reasonable spatial and temporal uh, scale, though of course we're constrained on those aspects. And so I'm going to be uh, calling these measurements of uh, correlations between different brain uh, regions, functional connectivity. There are of course many different ways of measuring the relationships across brain regions, and we can talk about those and their relative advantages later. Uh, but at its simplest level, uh, functional connectivity is just taking the bold signal from two different brain regions, for example, left and right motor cortex, and looking at how similar or different they are over time. So left and right motor cortex can, are highly similar, that it, and from that we might infer that they carry out some sort of um, similar process and are part of the same functional network. Um, whereas left visual cortex might show a very different sort of time series, and we might infer that it's part of a different network. So none of this is very surprising. What is sometimes surprising is that you can make all of these measurements while a participant is lying like a lump in the scanner, as Steve Peterson <laughs> likes to say, not doing anything in particular. They're not moving. They're not planning an action. And yet, they're left in the right motor cortex. And in fact, motor regions throughout the brain show correlated spontaneous activity. And that's true not just for those motor regions, but many other systems of the brain. And so with these resting state scans, you can map brain organization. Here I'm showing you for 264 regions th spread throughout cortex and subcortex. And I'm showing you the correlations in the form of a correlation matrix, where any given cell represents the correlation between a pair of regions. And I've organized the regions randomly in this case. Um, but if I reorder them, so I place regions that are part of the same system close to one another, you see this really nice uh, structure emerge in the correlation matrix. Uh, 
where you have high correlations along the diagonal, so it's called the block diagonal structure, um, and relatively lower correlations in the off diagonal, so indicating that there are high correlations within networks and low correlations between networks. And so you can use this sort of representation um, and then use data-driven community detection algorithms to identify the actual networks, which I'll mark here with red lines and paint onto the brain. Um, so what's nice it, about this approach is I'm taking people at rest, so in an unconstrained sort of task context, I am using data-driven community detection algorithms to identify networks, and yet I find these systems that recapitulate many known neurobiological systems of the brain. So you can identify the visual system, you can identify motor-related systems, as well as higher level association systems like the default mode network and frontal parietal and cingulate percular network and so forth. So it's a pretty powerful way to map brain network organization in a living human uh, being. And um, I think it then allows you to ask certain questions like, are power properties of this brain network organization linked to brain function and cognition? So that brings me to the first part of the talk, where we're going to look at whether or not network topology contributes to our understanding of brain function. And so our understanding of the consequences of brain lesions has followed a very similar dichotomy to the one I presented at the beginning, where a lot of work has gone, um, has taken the sort of localized processing perspective. Uh, some of the most famous examples are shown here. And in a lot of these cases, the logic goes something like this. You have a patient come in, they have a lesion to Broca's area, and they can no longer carry out speech function. And so from that, you might infer that uh, Broca's area normally uh, is important for speech. But uh, that requires the assumption that the rest of the brain continues to function normally. And in fact, sometimes we know that even small focal lesions can lead to widespread um, effects on behavior, suggesting that understanding something about the network context or the connectivity of the network may help us to interpret the consequences of those lesions. And so here we ask whether this network perspective can provide new insights into the consequences from brain damage. And so to address this question, we're going to turn to graph theory as a way of modeling the uh, large-scale networks in the brain. And so very simply, we just model the brain as a graph where individual nodes are different brain regions or units of activity. And uh, the edges in this graph are the, con are the functional connectivity measurements that I talked about earlier. And so, of course, one of the advantages of using graph theory is it's been used to study many different complex systems, uh, not just large-scale networks of the brain, but protein uh, metabolic interactions, social networks, which I think Ido will talk a little bit about as well tomorrow, um, as well as air transportation networks, the internet, and so forth. Um, so we can sort of take advantage of all of the theory that's been built up in these other domains to try to understand the brain as well. And so what I'd like to point out is that this approach allows you to extract certain pieces of information that might not be obvious from studying brain networks in sort of a physical or anatomical context. Um, so in, on the left-hand side, I've just plotted the graph where each node is uh, placed on the, um, on the image based on where it physically is in the brain. But on the right, I've repositioned the nodes in a graph space where nodes that are more tightly interconnected are placed closer to one another. And certain new properties are more readily uh, evident in this graph space. Uh, for example, you can more easily see certain properties of the graph as a whole. Um, you might be able to more easily tell, for example, that this graph has separate networks, where the red network seems to segregate, for example, from the other networks. That this is the default mode, uh, which is much, less, much more difficult to see in the sort of the anatomical embedding of this graph. Um, you can also uh, perhaps see that there might be interesting properties to individual nodes within this graph structure. For example, some of these nodes tend to lie more at the center of this graph space, suggesting that they may be important for mediating interactions between different networks. And so we can quantify these properties using various graph theoretical measures. I'm just going to kind of overview the measures right now. We'll talk about these in detail and how we calculate them later. 
Um, but the modularity statistic can be used to get an estimate of how um, well a graph divides up into different networks. So you, know, you can have two different graphs that are both fairly regular in structure, uh, but the graph on the left doesn't really seem to have these different subunits, whereas the uh, graph on the right does. And Newman's modularity uh, can quantify the difference between these two by taking, uh, comparing the proportion of edges that are within each individual mo module to the expected value of those connections. Um, we can also quantify the roles of individual nodes within this network structure. Um, so there are various ways of measuring hubs. Uh, one way might be to count the number of connections that a node has. So um, in, in this context, we might actually count the number of connections that the node has within its own network, and we would call these module hubs. Um, another way might be to see how diverse a node's connections are. Um, and so here we might look at how distributed a node's connections are across many different networks, and we would call these connector hubs. And um, again, you can measure these with various uh, graph theoretical properties. Uh, participation coefficient measures the extent to which any given node has distributed connections across different networks. And within module degree is a normalized measure of how many nodes uh, or how many connections a node has within its own module. Um, so you might imagine that these different nodes may have varying types of importance. Uh, if we take the analogy to the air transportation network, uh, an airport like the one in St. Louis, St. Louis Lambert, might be considered a uh, module hub. It has a lot of flights within the United States, but relatively few international flights. Whereas an airport like Chicago O'Hare may be considered more of a connector hub. Uh, it has a lot of international flights, and often if I want to travel to a further location, I need to go from St. Louis to Chicago first to be able to get there. And so. By this analogy, you might expect that the consequences of having weather disruptions in these different locations may be very different on air transportation across the globe. And similarly, having brain lesions to these different types of locations may have different consequences on brain function. And in fact, this work, um, so what we sought to test here is to examine that in uh, human brains, um, inspired in a bit by some of Chris Honey's uh, original work modeling this uh, in uh, models of human brain dynamics. Um, so here you can look at uh, where the connector hubs and module hubs are in human brains, and we tend to find connector hubs in locations such as the anterior insula and dorsal frontal and parietal cortex, uh, whereas we tend to find module hubs, uh, sorry, module hubs in regions such as the anterior and posterior cingulate. So we can now look at patients that have lesions to th these different types of regions to see what effect that has on their network organization. So I'm just going to really briefly overview the methods here. The basic approach to doing this is that we define nodes in the brain. In this case, for the study, we used 90 regions from the AL atlas. And then we uh, measured the functional connectivity between each of the regions. Here, again, by functional connectivity, it just means we took time series correlations between the regions at rest. We took this uh, correlation matrix and then thresholded it to have a set proportion of edges that pass that threshold, and we did use a number of different thresholds to test our results. And then we used this adjacency matrix to construct an unweighted, undirected graph, where, again, any given node uh, represents a region of the brain, one of the 90 regions from the AL atlas, and any of the edges on this graph represents one of those values that pass the threshold on the previous step. We can then use community detection algorithms to identify the network layout of the brain and use that to compute the modularity statistic as well as the roles of individual regions within the brain. <laughs> and so our strategy was to do all of this both for healthy controls to identify the typical locations for hubs in the brain and then for our lesion patients to look at how their networks were altered with these uh, brain lesions. So first, I'm just going to show you the typical networks we get out with these 90 regions and healthy controls. These are two brain-like schematics, a top-down view and a lateral view. And with these very uh, 90 very large regions, we tend to find four kind of conglomerated networks, a green frontal parietal network, a red central temporal network, a blue mediotemporal temporal network, and a purple occipital parietal network. Um, what you'll also notice, um, hopefully, is that there are relatively few black lines on these images. Those are the between module connections which emphasizes that these networks are indeed fairly modular. Most of the connections that are found are within each network. Uh, 
And so we had uh, 35 lesion patients in this study that had primarily lesions due to stroke um, and had lesions to many different areas of the brain. So this is just an overlap map of their lesion locations. Um, the reason I emphasize this is that because it then allowed us to uh, ask the question of how lesions to different types of regions might affect network organization. And so I'm going to just cut to the chase and say that what we found is that lesions to those connector hub regions are the ones that really seem to affect network organization. So here's the graph again from the healthy controls that I showed you earlier. Here's a graph from a patient with low amounts of damage to a connector hub. So the actual site of damage is shown with a star here. And what you can see is that their network structure looks fairly intact. In fact, it looks very similar to that of the healthy control brain. If we look instead at a patient with high amounts of connector hub damage, so the sites of damage shown here, you can see that their network structure looks very disrupted with a lot of those black between module connections. Um, and this is true even though these two pa patients were matched for the overall amount of damage that they had. And so we can quantify this effect across all of our participants uh, by looking at how much damage they had, whether the amount of damage that they had to connector hubs was related to the network organization. So each dot in the scatter plot represents a single participant. Their position along the x-axis represents the amount of damage they had to these connector hubs. And their position along the y-axis is their modularity, so this measure of like network uh, integrity that they had. And so what you can see is that having more damage to connector hubs was related to having relatively lower modularity uh, in their brain. Interestingly, the same was not true of the damage to module hubs, so this effect seemed to be fairly specific to this type of hub that we measured. And in fact, these two correlations were significantly different from one another. We next asked whether these effects were truly widespread. So to address this question, we actually created two separate graphs, one graph for each hemisphere, so in healthy controls for the left and the right hemisphere, and in the lesion patients for the lesioned and the non-lesioned hemisphere. And so we can look again at that patient with low amounts of connector hub damage, and what you might see is that their network structure, again, looks fairly intact, especially in the structurally intact hemisphere. Um, but if you look at that patient with high amounts of connector hub damage, the graph structure looks disrupted not only in the damaged hemisphere, but also in the structurally intact hemisphere. So this suggests that lesions are having fairly widespread effects on uh, network structure in the brain. And again, we can quantify this effect for all of our participants and see that that negative relationship is present not only in the lesion hemisphere, but also in the non-lesion hemisphere. And once again, it's different from, or um, there is no effect that is seen with the module hub damage. What was kind of neat is that or, um, shortly thereafter, a separate study came out from a collaboration between the Peterson Lab and um, uh, David Warren at um, University of Iowa, where they have their large uh, lesion database, where they looked at how um, patients who had damage to connector hubs, so the different uh, columns over here, or a set of comparison locations very similar to the module hubs, how they performed uh, behaviorally on a, across a number of different neuropsychological domains. So the participants were rated by uh, neuropsychologists um, in their impairment across all of these domains. Um, and what they found was that patients that had damage to the connector hubs had much more widespread and severe impairments across many of these different domains. So not only does it seem like these lesions are affecting the uh, network organization, but it seems like they also have consequences for behavior. And so to summarize, uh, here we saw that lesions to connector hubs decrease network organization. They do so in this sort of widespread sense. You see it even in areas of the uh, intact hemisphere. And it seems to be fairly specific to certain types of regions. Hmm? Sorry about that. Sign in for my flight. <laughs> Southwest, don't you know? Um, so, uh, so yes, and what's, what's interesting is that not only do we see these impairments in network organization, but also, sorry. Okay. but also in behavior. So I think this is exciting because it sort of validates the idea that using these network measures may tell us something about brain function. It suggests that having focal damage can sometimes cause these really widespread disruptions and that perhaps understanding something about uh, the network organization um, 
per, in particular whether these regions are hubs or not, may tell us about the extent of disruption that we might expect to see. <laughs> like this. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I think beyond that, it also just tells us something about sort of network healthy brain organization because it suggests that these connector hubs may be quite important for or um, how we normally maintain uh, networks in the healthy brain. And it also tells us that something about how we might predict clinical outcomes and direct rehabilitation efforts um, in lesion patients. In fact, in a recent project that I was involved in, um, these sort of measures were used to, exam um, to try to predict whether or not individual patients would improve after, um, these were TBI patients, would improve after a course of cognitive behavioral therapy. And interestingly, uh, what they found is that these measures, or at least the modularity statistics, seem to predict uh, improvement better than executive function measures taken at baseline. And so hopefully this will um, sort of add to the perspective that not only do we learn a lot by understanding sort of the local functions of regions from brain lesions, but that we might also learn something by placing um, sort of the ideas of brain regions into the context of these networks to try to understand what their consequences might be. Okay, so I'm gonna shift to the next section, but just to give you guys a quick pause in case you had questions on that. Yeah, I mean, in the case, I think you could have gone either way. In the case of the TBI patients, they didn't all have overt lesions that were like measurable. So they, these were TBI, so that sometimes they just had white matter sort of damage. Um, so we didn't connect them to the hub locations that were damaged. Um, I guess my um, there what we saw is that people who had higher modularity, so basically more similar to the healthy control brains at baseline, were the ones that improved the most. So you could have predicted the other way around that those that had the most to go, basically, that had had the most disruption would improve um, most strongly. Um, but we didn't see that. So I guess based on that prediction, I expect that less damage to connector hubs would actually pre predict better recovery in the long run. It's not predefined, so we um, used a modularity optimization algorithm to identify the communities in each case, and so in that case, they just didn't organize well into different communities um, by that algorithm. Yeah, so um, so they probably do have a little bit of a different community structure, and that's actually something that I will be talking about more in the next part of the talk. It's a little hard to say whether or not they started out with a different community structure and then it's disrupted, or if it was most disrupted by the damage. So we're kind of making the inference that the healthy community structure is the best estimate that we have of those individuals' communities beforehand, um, but that's probably not exactly right. Um, but you know, nonetheless, it seems to provide some information uh, about the sort of disruption that we'd be likely to see. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think I, you've exactly hit on um, one of the points. So it's true, if we look in healthy individuals, for example, and we look at the number of connector hubs that they have and their modularity, there is an inverse relationship. So having more connector hubs has more between module connections and therefore it lowers modularity. And you would have predicted that in lesion patients, therefore taking away the connector hubs would actually raise the modularity. And so it's interesting to us that we found the opposite effect. I think it does suggest something um, more complex in the dynamics that's going on than what we're measuring in sort of the static network representation. Um, and yeah, so I think you're right. I don't know exactly what that is based on our data. Yeah, so the, the next section um, is going to look at a little bit more of these measures of like individual variability in um, brain networks and also how brain networks may change across different state contexts. So, um, so as I introduced at the beginning, um, people are, have become increasingly interested in using these methods, especially resting state fMRI, to ask many different questions about brain networks. Um, in particular, how brain networks may be altered with brain damage and disease, like I just um, introduced, how they may be different across different individuals, how they may change across the lifespan, or also how they may change in different cognitive contexts. And so um, I think there's been a lot of excitement because it's a relatively straightforward way, perhaps, to map brain organization um, and how it may change. However, these different types of questions really notably depend on these functional network measurements being either relatively stable over time, so that we can take a single measurement at, say, rest, and therefore infer qualities of the individual, uh, such as their disease status or their age, whereas others may depend on these brain networks being quite variable or sensitive to different contextual dynamics, for example, trying to understand how these networks may change with ongoing processing. And so I think there's a fair amount of work that still needs to be done to try to understand how stable these brain network measurements really are. And so this kind of takes off of Chris's talk earlier. Um, and here, when I'm talking about functional brain networks, I do want to emphasize that I'm going to be talking about bold functional connectivity measurements. And um, as I'll introduce in a second, I'm going to be talking about taking the measurements in these sort of spontaneous signals, not in sort of the intercorrelations between um, people, which gets rid of the, a lot of the spontaneous level activity, which I think you'll be hearing about from other people throughout this week. Um, but with these measurements that many people use, um, there are kind of two hypotheses that motivate a lot of papers that are present in the literature. One hypothesis, or one uh, sort of unspoken hypothesis, is that functional connectivity networks are primarily stationary, so that you can take these measurements and therefore decide if a person has Parkinson's disease or not. But another hypothesis is that these networks will reconfigure uh, substantially with ongoing processing, with mood, and so forth, and so that you can take these measurements and get some um, estimate of their, the person's cognition in a certain state. And so I think this, it's important to try to understand the relative um, con contribution of these two types of effects because it changes how we think about the sort of neurobiological underpinnings of these functional connectivity measurements and how we think about doing comparisons between d different groups and individuals. And it also changes how we might use functional connectivity in different medical applications. And so we can think of these along a uh, sort of time scale um, of a sort where we might think that these resting state networks are really mostly invariant. That is, any differences we measure between people or over time are due to sampling variability or measurement noise. Or on the other extreme, that they may show substantial moment to moment variation as we um, undergo different types of processing, even while we're sitting at rest, as we think about you know, our shopping list for the next day or uh, whether or not we remember our friend's birthday last week. Um, but intermediate to that, you can also think that these brain networks may change with sort of slower changes in brain states, like engaging different tasks or falling asleep, that they may change more slowly over the course of days with circadian rhythms, um, that they may change uh, with only extensive experience in different tasks, uh, for example, um, extensive training in a perceptual task or that they may be primarily stable within an individual, differing between individuals or over the course of the lifespan. And so I think there's evidence um, on both sides of these continuum. Uh, on one end, if you take group depictions of uh, resting state networks, 
they look really similar um, across large groups, across different sites, across different with different clustering techniques. So these are two different studies, one by Jonathan Power and one by Thomas Yeo, uh, estimating the typical large-scale networks that we find in the brain. And I think you'll hopefully agree with me that there is a lot of correspondence between these. Um, on the other extreme, there's evidence that there is state dependence to these networks. So we recently did a study looking at how networks change across different task states. Um, and across three fairly diverse task states, so a semantic task where participants saw word and they were asked to make a noun or verb judgment on this word, a mental rotation task where they saw two objects, had to say whether they were the same or mirror images on one, of one another, and a coherence task where they saw an array of dots on the screen they had to decide whether or not they were arranged concentrically. And so we contrasted these different, um, these different task contexts with a resting state uh, where participants sat quietly with their eyes open and fixating. And we measured uh, functional connectivity in each of these contexts. Importantly, for our task functional connectivity approach, we actually used the background connectivity approach, where we uh, removed the evoked signal from the task using a GLM, and we took correlations and the residuals from that model. So here we're looking at coherent changes in sort of the background or spontaneous activity that there is in these different contexts. And um, again, just to emphasize this, this might be kind of complementary to some of the intersubject correlation approach that I think you'll hear from Ida and Chris later on. Or, no, sorry. Um, so, um, on the state, so from this paper, we saw that functional networks measured in this way share a lot of similarity between rest and task context. Um, so if you look at just the correlation matrices, you'll see that they both have this really strong block diagonal structure, and in fact, they look very similar to one another, and it's quite hard um, at, with an, um, sort of looking at it by eye to see differences between the two. However, if you take the direct comparison between the two, you also see fairly systematic and significant uh, changes that are consistent across subjects. Uh, for example, there are changes both um, along the diagonal that is within the different networks. Um, we see decreases in visual system coherence and increases in default mode coherence during tasks. As well as in between different systems, for example, we see increases in the coherence between visual and frontal parietal regions during tasks. Um, and so what we further showed in this paper is that these changes are related to the topological and functional properties of these brain regions. Um, that is, regions that were connector hubs or that were activated as specialized for different aspects of the task seem to be the ones that were changing, particularly in these different contexts. Now, in the interest of time today, because uh, I think I'm already running a little bit over, I'm not going to talk in more detail about that, but hopefully um, if people have questions, you can um, ask me later or look up the paper. So here I've presented evidence on both ends of the spectrum that is for the invariance of the brain networks and also uh, changes with brain states. Um, but I think the question is, how, what, are the, what are the relative contributions of these two types of effects? How do they vary in their magnitude and the distribution across the brain? And so we, in, in a recent project, we've been looking at that using a data set spearheaded by Dr. Nico Dosenbach and colleagues at WashU. It's called the Midnight Scan Club data set. Nico wanted to um, mimic Russ Poldrack's data set, but in a larger group of people, 10 people, but he had no money, so he asked a bunch of people to come in at midnight, and so they scanned a lot of people at midnight, um, 10 times each for 10 different sessions. So this data, I hope you, if you're ever interested in this sort of questions, you should use it. It's on OpenFMRI, uh, and there's a recent paper describing it. And what's nice about this is that with this really large amount of data, you can now um, sort of more, much more precisely map these individual brain networks. So I'm showing you sort of the group network that I showed you earlier in the center, and arrayed on the outside are eight of the different subjects' networks. And hopefully you'll see there's some similarity in the networks that individual subjects have um, to the group, but there are also clear patches of differences, these sort of um, what we might call these individual patches where the individual varies from the group in each case. And so and this data set's really well suited to addressing the question I posed because not only does it have these um, 10 subjects with 10 sessions, but it also has uh, data not only from REST but for different tasks. So the semantic task and coherence task I introduced earlier, as well as this motor uh, task and incidental memory, um, incidental encoding task with faces, scenes, and words. 
So we can try to separate effects that are common across the full group and effects that are selected to individual subjects or sessions or task states. So um, here we measured functional networks separately from each subject from each state in each, in each session. Um, so just to show you two examples, this is the data from two different subjects so across the five different tasks. And what you'll see is that some of the uh, examples of each of the effects. Um, so for example, both of these subjects have some, um, some block diagonal structure indicating that they have some commonality in their network organization. But there are also clear differences in uh, the correlation matrices between these subjects, as well as within a subject across different sessions, for example, between the motor and rest session here, and between the coherence and rest session here. And so we can examine the relative magnitude of these effects in a data-driven manner using multidimensional scaling. So in this plot, the individual dots represent single correlation matrices, and they're arranged in this multidimensional space based on their similarity. Um, so these are showing the first two dimensions, and on the left I've colored the dots based on which subject they belong to, and on the right I've colored the dots based on which task that they come from. And I think what you'll immediately pop out to you here is that in this early dimension, the data is mostly organized by subject. So the subject level similarity dominates the similarity between different matrices. And, only, and we have to go to higher dimensions to start to see divisions that are based on task states. So for example, the motor task separates out first, and then the sort of other tasks all follow in even higher dimensions. So this suggests that subject similarity um, is a really driving force, uh, and we can quantify this effect um, more by using these sort of matrix similarity um, depictions. So in this matrix, any given cell represents the similarity between a given pair of matrices from a particular subject, task, state, and session. And so I've organized these first by subject, and then within that by task, and then within that by session. So there's a lot going on in this matrix, but just to try to break it down a little bit, what we see is that, first off, the background of the matrix is not at zero, but it's at this sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 level. So this indicates that there's some similarity that's shared across all the matrices, um, regardless of which subject or state that they come from. However, what's probably also very obvious to you is that there's this strong block diagonal, that is, matrices from the same subject, regardless of the task or the state, show a large increase in similarity on top of that. So there are probably equal effects of sort of group level shared similarity and individual specific effects. In addition, there's some evidence for task um, by individual sort of interactions. These are these little mini blocks that exist along the diagonal. So the same task state from the same individual gives you an extra boost in similarity. Um, there's also a little bit of a boost from the same sessions and the same individuals. It's really small and it's hard to see on this color scale. And similarly, the same tasks from different individuals do show a little bit of a boost relative to the group, and this is highly significant, but again, it's hard to see on this color scale because the effects are so dominated by the subject-specific um, effects. And so these are all significantly different from one another. Um, I just, moreover, I just want to emphasize that this pattern is pretty consistent both across individual subjects. So here I can just show it to you for all uh, nine subjects that we included here. I didn't mention at the beginning, we excluded one subject because they uh, self-reported that they were sleeping during the scans and they also moved a lot more than everybody else. Um, so if you ever use this data set, don't use that subject. MSC08. <laughs> 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 um, and then uh, it's fairly consistent across the different tasks. It's a little bit dependent on the amount of data per task, but if you match for the amount of data, it's pretty consistent across the different tasks. Um, and so to summarize, here we saw evidence that all networks share substantial basic organization, regardless of the subject or task that they belong to. Um, but that subject effects are also quite large, um, and that they may be, we think they may be associated both with a combination of basic, stable, anatomical differences between subjects as well as functional differences. Um, we also see evidence for substantial added task effects, but the biggest parts of the task effects are actually subject specific. So there's an interaction between task and subject. Um, and so that the task, cross subject task effects are small, still high, but still highly significant. And so um, in the next part, we wanted to look at how these, were, these different types of effects were distributed across the brain. And so one simple division we can do is just look at how the effects were, uh, were 
how, to what extent these effects were present in control regions of the brain. So here we're calling senior opercular, frontal parietal, dorsal and ventral attention and salience networks, control related networks, or sensory motor regions of the brain like the visual and somatomotor and auditory systems. And so what we find here is that these sort of um, individual specific effects were largest in control networks, so shown in red relative to the processing networks, whereas the cross subjects effects were largest in uh, the processing networks. And um, I think I'm a little short on time, so I'm gonna skip this, but if people are interested, I'll talk about it later. Um, but we can break these effects down even further by individual brain region, um, and you kind of see similar patterns uh, to these effects. So to summarize, uh, here we showed evidence for functional network effects at multiple timescales, with functional, some evidence that functional networks have large cross subject stability, as well as uh, large individual level effects, so, so suggesting that they are largely stable in nature given these two metrics. However, there's also moderate but significant state level effects, many of which are individually specific, and these types of effects are localized differently with individual specific effects most prominent in control systems and state level effects most prominent in processing or combination of processing and control systems. And so I hope you'll think that these findings are important, um, both for understanding the potential neurobiological contributions of functional connectivity, suggesting that much of what we call resting state functional connectivity are really stable measures. Uh, that don't change substantially over time, um, but that there are these sort of moderate level task state effects that ride on top of that. And um, I think this may hopefully help to interpret functional connectivity comparisons that exist between different groups and uh, different states, depending on, in particular on where these effects may be localized in the brain. And finally, um, I think these, uh, while these findings may not seem very exciting for those of us interested in sort of studying cognition with resting state functional connectivity, I think they are exciting for trying to uh, understand medical applications of functional connectivity because they tell us that taking these measurements at rest may give us some um, estimates uh, or some uh, fairly good estimate of what brain organization is like in these individuals across many different task contexts. So, for example, in surgical planning, a resting state scan may be quite informative although you may additionally want to have some state-based scans um, across different task contexts, but they may be quite informative for telling you how the brain was organized in individual subjects. And so um, just to summarize, the first part of the talk, we looked at how hub lesions alter brain organization, um, finding evidence that connector hubs cause these large uh, changes in network organization. And in the second part, we saw evidence that there were very large trait effects and moderate state effects in uh, brain networks. And so hopefully together these findings suggest that this sort of network view can provide new insights into the link between cognition and brain function. And I just wanna close by thanking my collaborators on these projects, uh, in particular my mentors, Steve Peterson, Mark Disposito, Michael Silver, and again, make a plug for my upcoming lab if any of you are interested or know someone who might be interested um, in working on these sort of projects. Thank you all. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we've recently been doing a project trying to um, sort of validate those measures with other measures and seeing if they also predict individual differences in behavior. Um, and it does look like they do. Um, so what's kind of neat is, so first off, what, what's interesting is if you find one of these sort of patches in an unusual place, they seem to carry the functional characteristics of uh, the network that they're reassigned to. So like a default mode patch that's in the middle of the frontal parietal network now deactivates during tasks instead of activating. So that's a nice piece of validation that this is actually measuring something that's like functionally, a new functionally relevant unit. Um, and on top of that, people that have different, uh, people tend to c cluster in the types of variants that they have and groups of people with these different cluster, within these different clusters seem to have different performance across neuropsychological tasks. So I, we're excited about that work. It's kind of ongoing, but. <laughs>
Yeah, so the goal here was to look at these changes in the correlations between different brain regions. And so there's kind of twofold um, rationale. One was that we didn't want to inflate correlation measurements with the evoked signal per se. We weren't trying to measure correlations in the evoked activity between different brain regions. We wanted to look at how the sort of signals might be spontaneously correlating between different brain regions. Um, and so we removed it to reduce the influence of this sort of um, evoked activation. So for example, in a stimulus that has both visual and auditory signals, those signals are you know, c concurrent in time, and so they may drive correlations in a way that we didn't want to. Um, in that task in particular, in that study in particular, we were also interested in looking at how related those evoked signals were to the functional connectivity signals. So it seemed particularly important to us to try to separate out their two uh, pieces of influence. But I think you know both are interesting to look at in sort of diff with different interpretations of what they may be measuring. No, I think that's a great question. So I would say that the current tests that we have set up aren't really ideally suited to asking that question because a lot of them are event related, um, which means that piecing out different pieces of the tasks gets really hard to do with functional connectivity. Um, the motor test was block designs, and so I did look separately at the different blocks, and they are different from one another in the functional connectivity profiles. but. I think what we might especially be interested in is like different aspects of sort of control functions and a more structured design, or at least that's what I would be interested in. Um, and I think that's sort of left to do. So um, yes, in the future, I think it will be cool to try to design tasks more specifically to try to get at the finer time scales and see how much information we can extract. That said, based on this evidence, I'd say that the bulk of the signal is probably not in these sort of uh, state-based effects. <laughs> 